good day. It's Bob Purvey talking to everybody from the Malibu Lagoon Restoration Project. I'm here with Don Hartley from Growing Solutions. And uh, we met originally uh, on the very first day when you guys were salvaging plants. And uh, there were like, I don't know, six cops or something with all the protesters that were trying to s- obstruct this project from going forward and now we're back at the uh practically at the end of the project and you've planted how many plants have you planted so far we've planted about twenty-five thousand plants in the lower elevations we still have another forty thousand to plant in the upper and uh we are going to use plants that we found at the malibu at the point magoo and in some other reference sites right around here bayona down here and here uh, we'll try to keep the uh, height of them down so that the, uh, the viewscape stays the same. But we've been working really hard up in Santa Barbara to kick out about 68,000 to 70,000 plants for this project. Wow, and right here on this island, can you kind of describe what, how are you going to set up the plants? Well, it's just going to be a whole uh, mix, a really nice, uh, diverse mix of upland species. What we've planted so far is the lowland stuff. So. It'll be the upland stuff that you would normally see, oh, at Leo Carrillo, or you would see uh, any one of these state parks along the coast, or upland. And so on the uh, top layer where that seagull is right now, right. Uh, you're going to have what kind of plants? Oh, there's about uh, 60 different species. One of the best biologically diverse plant palettes we've ever worked with. You know, I heard there were a bunch of birds that returned like a thousand coots, all of a sudden appeared and started, you know, covering these islands. Did you happen to see that? The bird life here is going to be amazing. Yeah. This is going to be one of the bird uh, watching meccas for Southern California here. Uh, Once, you know, the heavy equipment's out of here and the plants start to come back, people are going to be amazed by the increase of diversity and abundance. Hey, Don, thanks. This is exquisite. It's extraordinary. It's spectacular. I can't say enough about it. And really, thank you so very much for helping out and, you know, helping to create the return, the restoration of this wetland. My my pleasure. You take care. Thank you. Just talked to Don Hartley of uh, Plant Solutions. Yes. And he gave a full explanation of what had happened. Oh, yeah. They'll have so much more diversity. And you'll have different colors of plants. I mean, it was pretty much a monoculture before, just or three or four different plants. We didn't have that much here. But now we have all the good wetland plants that we're supposed to have and that probably were and as actually were here in the past that were documented as being here. One of the questions I have is about this swale. And, you know, this swale is going to take up the, the uh, drainage that that pipe used to drain from the mm-hmm. colony road. Can you explain how the swale will help alleviate some of the, you know, pollutants that were going into the lagoon? The, the colony residents have a drainage easement to discharge their surface drainage into the state property. In the past, before we started this project, all that drainage came through pipes and went directly into the lagoon or directly onto the property without any kind of treatment or anything like that. In the process of doing this project, we found a lot more pipes than we really realized were here. A lot of them were probably not being used anymore, but we actually found even old sewer pipes, big clay sewer pipes. So it's possible that sewage was discharged here at one time. I don't think now. But now that we have a drainage swale, all of that drainage is going to go into this swale or ditch that we've built here, and that will be planted with native plants, with wetland plants, And so the water will be able to be infiltrated into the soil. The fact that the plants are there will slow down the flow of the water. It's a gradual descending elevation as you go from the east to the west here. And uh, the plants will soak up some of the nutrients and absorb some of the nutrients. And then whatever does not infiltrate will end up the residual going into the lagoon. But it will be at a much reduced rate and uh, most of it will be already infiltrated into the soil. And uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, what do you think the uh, improvement will be about in, in terms of water quality? Well, I'm tempted to say a 10, you know, but we won't really know until we do our tests. But I'm sure in terms of the uh, water quality, especially the dissolved oxygen that we were concerned about, that it's going to be much, much better because 
as you can see when you look out into the lagoon, there's going to be more open water now when the lagoon is closed, which it is now. And the wind fetch will help to circulate the water. You can see the ripples of, uh, of the surface of the water. And that will help to oxygenate the water. So as far as dissolved oxygen, I think it's going to be much, much better. And, of course, the plants out there are going to help. And it's all yes. wetlands, yes. natural, organic yes. wetlands that are back, restored, right. and functioning to cleanse the water. That's right. And there will be, we hope to see, a lot more invertebrates and things for the birds to eat. And the birds actually have been more plentiful in here now than the day we started when all the vegetation was here. And uh, so it's really just been a revelation every day to see something different. But the birds are just, they're just kind of waiting, you know. They're waiting for us all to get out of here so they can come in and reestablish themselves. And, you know, the uh, stories that we're able to believe that the wildlife and the endangered coat goby was going to be decimated and they were no longer going to be able to thrive here and they claim that this area was thriving when in fact it was a dysfunctional area and I was told that the Gobi never really uh, spawned here they spawned upstream that's right as a matter of fact we have Gobi fishers here today that are going to go and look upstream but they never really reproduced inside of this um, the western channels as we used to call them because it was full of fine grain, dense, dark sediment, and they can't breed in that. They have to have sand as a substrate. They build their burrows in sand. And so this never was a Gobi breeding area. But in the process of taking out all of the uh, deposited sediment that was in here and the deposited fill that was placed in here during the Caltrans days, we uncovered the original soil. And so we now have sandy bottom in a lot of this place. So it could be that the gobies will come in and breed, and we definitely will be monitoring for that. Oh, how exciting. How really exciting. It really is. Yeah. And, you know, I suppose that the steelhead trout will also come back. The limiting factor as far as the steelhead is the ability to get upstream above Ridge Dam, which they cannot do right now. And there will be, you know, habitat for them to to use as they learn how to become seagoing fish. Now, the removal of Ringe Dam, that will increase the area for the steelhead to travel and spawn, yes. and, and that's a significant impediment to the uh, natural regime of the steelhead. Absolutely. I mean, Malibu Creek watershed is huge. It's 105 square miles. And undoubtedly, back in the old days, before people came along and built structures in the creek, those fish were able to probably go all the way upstream to the farthest reaches of the, the, um, the originating waters. But because Ridge Dam was built just two miles up from the ocean ever since 1926, they've only had two miles of Malibu Creek to use for spawning and rearing. As this wildlife habitat returns to a thriving, uh, full restoration, will it serve as a billboard for the upper watershed. Having the lagoon here and a restored habitat here will be, I think, an inspiration for people in the upper watershed and the other cities and the counties to want to protect this gem now that we've restored it and brought it back. And in order to keep it healthy, we have to keep pollution away at its source. So that means all the parking lots, all the streets, all the fertilizer that people might be applying to their lawns, um, all the excessive watering all the, the grease and, and the oil from the freeways. All of this has to be addressed and captured at its source before it gets into the creek in the first place.